All right, recording in progress. So Heather Mack, thank you so much for joining me this afternoon. Uh, still the morning here uh, for this conversation. Really, really glad to be with you. Um, yeah, so thanks for being here. No, thanks for thinking of me for this. I'm excited to participate. Awesome. Well, uh, so let's just jump into the questions and uh, give folks a chance to know who you are before I start peppering you with more detailed materiality thoughts. So who are you, Heather, and what are you up to? <laughs> so I'm Heather Mack, as you've already explained. Uh, I'm a mom, I'm a sister, I'm a daughter. I'm also an independent sustainability consultant. Um, I've been in sustainability for about 15 years and I've worked with Lorraine uh, many of those years. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> And uh, I've mainly focused on the consumer goods and retail space. Uh, I'm also a co-founder of um, the network Diversity and Sustainability. So that's uh, both of those things uh, occupy a lot of my time at the moment. Awesome. And I always explain how or if I'm connected to a stakeholder when I do these interviews. So I love the fact that you and I connect in so many ways. I can't even really remember. Uh, but I think that I'm telling the truth when I say, uh, while I was a board member at CBSR, you were a staff member there. So Canadian Business for Social Responsibility. And then when I was working out of Sustainability's office in New York, you were also working with them in London. And now we have the good fortune to crisscross on a few ESG projects with our good friends at Buzzword. So I feel like you are keeping me honest because <laughs> <as I laughs> you actually know what you're talking about and do really incredible work in the ESG trenches and also breaking new ground with your work around diversity and sustainability. So I'm very, very grateful that you're here for this moment. And the feeling is mutual. I think you keep me honest on all of these things too. So I appreciate oh. it, Lorraine. <laughs> well, thank you. And uh, here we are keeping each other honest and we're going to break new ground in looking at this company, Danone. Um, so before we go too far into the questions about Danone, I just wanted to check if you have or have had any commercial relationship with the company we're about to talk about. Uh, so, you know, other than being a periodic consumer of yogurt products for my daughter, <laughs> <laughs> or, you know, potentially getting some bottled water while I'm on holiday or something, um, and none that I can think of. I actually had a job interview with them when I oh. finished my undergrad degree, and I didn't take the role with them, but um, that's that's about it. <laughs> <laughs> that's wow, interesting. What was the? Do you remember? Would you be comfortable saying what the role was? It like was for a. Uh, it was like for an entry level marketing role um, mm -hmm. at the time, but uh, um, yeah, I I didn't end up taking it because I saw myself back in Toronto. Interesting. The the road not taken, eh? That's so yes. <laughs> cool. All right. Well, thank you for those introductory thoughts, and let's jump in here. So I like to set the stage a bit before we go into details on the particular company to get a sense of the future that you are aiming for. And I'll just clarify, you more than most people in the world would be very familiar with the jargon out there, the, you know, the regenerative economy, circularity, all the fun words that get thrown around. This is a time to put the future you want in your words. What is it like in as much detail as you feel you'd like yeah. to Yeah, yeah, so I think the future I wanna see is that we live in harmony with nature, not in that cliched way, but actually recognizing that, you know, we humans are part of nature. And the one person who I love how he described it was um, Dr. Dave Crochane. And so he he's uh, um, an indigenous elder who uh, ran um, the Turtle Lodge in Manitoba. And so he's he sort of positioned it as seeing nature as our kin. And I thought like, what a beautiful way to, to talk about nature. Um, so I think the future that we want, that's kind of the central focus of it. I think living in supportive communities where people have a good but not extravagant standard of living, um, you know, they have the resources they need to thrive. Um, one other concept is like experiencing wonder and leisure as well. Just like we're not machines. We are beings that are, are part of nature as well. And if you look at... Um, all sorts of creatures, they have time for rest, they have time for, for play. And so it's just 
keeping that in mind too is is important. Oh wow, I love that future. <laughs> <laughs> let's uh, let's go there. And and on that note, so thank you very much for describing that. And if you could hold that future that you just described as a kind of thought bubble, as I take you through the next few questions about Danone, that would be great. Because what we're really comparing here is the company in relation to that future, the one that you want. So with that in mind, let's jump into uh, talking about what matters most about Danone. And I want to just remind us for anybody listening, I think you, Heather, you've done enough uh, other materiality assessments to know, um, but here we're really talking about the business model itself, how the company generates revenue, not so much it's philanthropic efforts or, you know, kind of sponsorships, but it's actual uh, revenue generating activities. So let's go into Denon's relationship with that future you described, and let's start with the positive so thinking about positive impacts, what would you describe as things you see the company doing that have a positive contribution to that future you described? Yeah, so first I'll just caveat that I haven't worked with them directly. And um, this is from what I've seen from public communications. Mm -hmm. But if I were to look at um, their product portfolio, generally, if I look at some of their peers, you know, they have a, a generally uh, I think a lot of their products are focused on necessities. So there's drinking water, there's baby formula, and maybe depending on who you ask, um, uh, dairy and plant-based milk products, which mm -hmm. some may say are ne necessities, some not. Um, for baby formula, I know that to be a very controversial issue. Mm -hmm. um, just in my own life, I, I breastfed my daughter for the most part, and it was a lot of work. <laughs> and, mm -hmm. uh, um, I know that baby formula can be helpful for people who can't breastfeed their children. It's helpful for parents that want to share in feeding their child. So um, anyway, so I think there's there's a lot on that front. Um, I think one other thing was uh, that's positive. I, I've noticed amongst their communications there, they seem to take a landscape approach to some of their sustainability impacts, which which I was uh, impressed by. I thought that that was a much more thoughtful approach rather than, you know, I'm just focusing on carbon or I'm just mm -hmm. focusing on this issue and not tying it to the, the other impact. So I see some, um, some uh, you know, sparks there that, that they can build on. Um, but yeah, so I think those are some of the positives that I saw. Cool. Um, I'm going to dig just a tiny bit on some of that because I know you have a lot of experience in working with food manufacturers, retailers, etc. So your perspective here would be really valuable. And of course, there's no right or wrong, uh, but I'm just going to poke a little. You talked about the plant-based um, products. Do you want to say a little bit more about how that does or doesn't contribute to the future you want? And and I know this is like a very fraught and deep topic. So. Um, <laughs> I'd be really curious your thoughts. Yeah, yeah. So I guess it's just recognizing the impact of um, dairy milk products, uh, just mm -hmm. in terms of the environmental footprint. Uh, if we think of uh, methane uh, and, of course, carbon emissions as a result of that, the animal welfare implications, um, yeah, and, and just uh, all all those sorts of things that come with uh, dairy production. Um, I think depending on what you use for plant-based milks, it might be less intensive. So for example, almond milk is not very good and depletes a lot of water sheds, especially in California where water is very scarce. Um, so yeah, so I think, mm -hmm. um, you know, in general, if you look at some other um, uh, milks that are less intensive. If you look at oat milk, um, soy milk, to some extent, uh, it, it can be less intensive than, than dairy production. But at the same time, we'll probably get into this later, um, any intensive crop uh, can can be quite harmful. So yeah. anyway. <laughs> yeah, cool. I love, that. yeah, as you're bumping into, it's so nuanced and there's so many uh, different answers to that. So thank you. Um, I was intentionally 
prompting the not simplistic, like, you know, mm-hmm. meat bad, plant good. So I'm glad you you brought us there. And, and let's go down uh, the other trail then. Let's look at some of the negative impacts. So when you think of the company in relation to that future you want, uh, where do you see some concerns, some things that might be undermining that future activities, impacts in any detail you can offer? Yeah, so I think there's some... Um, industry related concerns. So I think processed food in general, I think you often give that example of like, why is there a healthy food aisle? And uh, what is everything else? Like, I, I think one of the interesting things in their integrated report, they had a section on, um, you know, things that they're focused on, on renovating their portfolio. And it said, nutrients that matter, no added sugars and more natural <laughs> so that you think why do we have food that is you know empty to begin with so that that doesn't make sense to me but yeah. um I think also you know they're part of a system of global supply chains that promote intensive agriculture and not managed well um that that leads to a lot of degradation so I don't know all the details of their supply chains but just for the food industry in general it it can be quite harmful Mm -hmm. um milk production I I talked about that already I think there's something around um seeing animals as commodities that kind of ties back to that future I said where you know we are part of nature but all of a sudden these cat these cows are milk machines it's like whoa, whoa wait 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 these are these are beings right and you know being forced to be pregnant to produce milk like it's it's uh um it's really just beyond sometimes when I think of it Mm -hmm. um plus all the implications with um uh feed and waste and and that kind of thing um another one is uh water extraction so Mm -hmm. bottled water companies you know it, it you know their argument sometimes is we provide a choice it's better than drinking pop which you know that's true but (laughs) at the same time uh water is a human right um is Mm. it ethical to be charging uh a lot of money for this water um when you know people need it to live and and uh you know people should be able to just turn on their tap and and have some water and not everyone has that luxury and in Canada too right so um yeah so that's that's uh one piece um another thing I I was just observing um in their financial statements was this idea of having on trend products and so Mm. I get it I when I before I worked in sustainability I used to work for a candy company and it was just this endless battle for for share of stomach uh but uh, but <laughs> which I wow so, stomach share I never thought the about stomach that. share right yeah. and so it's it's interesting because uh you know there are these foods that become trendy all of a sudden like quinoa for example and then there are real implications at the at the grower end of things and it's like whoa um so I think there's some um, some concern on that front that that I think of often. Um, another one is just uh, it, it pertains to the whole industry, but this idea of food sovereignty as well. So just mm-hmm. like can we survive forever on these massive supply chains, and um, you know, to what extent should we have control over our our own food systems um, mm-hmm. and growing food for ourselves as well? And you know, I often find it interesting as well that you know here in North America or in Europe or in the global north local food is like this luxury which is so weird that the the systems have been so distorted that like what was the norm and is natural becomes a luxury (laughs) whereas if you go somewhere else like in um uh probably less so China now but if you're somewhere in say South America or Turkey or something everything is local and it's just like that's that's that right so um yeah so I find that uh very very strange um yeah oh my (laughs) my laundry list (laughs) yeah that's great okay that's Uh, that's super is there more you want to add or there's a bit more there's a bit more here (laughs) go for it yeah please Uh, for baby formula as well I know historically there's been a lot of controversy over 
advertising and sort of manipulative tactics to stop women from breastfeeding. I think maybe authorities are a bit more stringent than they used to be, but that's always something to be careful of um, mm -hmm. all the time. So that uh, one other one, I think is another food industry concern is um, just, you know, you and I talk about this phrase regenerative, but like, what does it mean? And I, yeah. it's one of those weird words that have been co-opted by the industry yeah. where it's like, we don't actually have a definition of it, but it's generally these things and we don't know how we're measuring it either. But yeah. um, I, I just doubt that it refers to approaches that, you know, Afro-Indigenous farmers would have used over time that were actually regenerative and, and <laughs> yeah <laughs> uh, in harmony with um with nature so that's one other thing um and then I think one other thing that I saw in a headline was just relationships with suppliers so I I saw a headline that talked about how they cut a bunch of organic milk suppliers in the U.S. and it looked like it was very sudden so um, yeah, so I think there's something around paying, I would say, a, a thriving wage. I don't want to say a living wage, even a living wage to me seems even lower than it should be. But, yeah. um, you know, I, I think it's always about taking care of that ecosystem that you're in, not only from an environmental perspective, but just that social perspective as well, whether it's suppliers or customers or people eating the, the products um, which, which is really important. So, yeah. Yeah. That's great. Oh, that's such a good, <laughs> is, it, is there more? Nope. That is. The end. Okay, cool. Cool. That's fantastic. And, and there'll be room to kind of process a bit more of that in, in the coming questions. I want to do a quick bit of stitching just in case anybody is paying attention to this interview. Um, Something you said really relates to something that Fabricio Muriana, whom I interviewed also for this assessment, mentioned. So I just want to pull it together where he's based in Brazil. He's doing some interesting food work. And you mentioned uh, that, for example, in South America, we tend to see more local food systems. And yet one of the big projects he's involved in is in Belém, one of the big cities in mm -hmm. the Amazon basin, where the vast majority of their food is imported. It comes from oh, wow. the city even though the area is a huge and very diverse food producer. Mm -hmm. so this global supply chain thing that's happened is global. It's happening yeah. in all directions everywhere. And then a couple other quick things to stitch, and it's also me planting seeds for myself as I process this interview. You talked about how there is not um, a good definition of regenerative. And that sparks two things. Um, one is I'm reading Kristen Olson's Sweet in Tooth and Claw right now. She's mm. the author of The Soil Will Save Us. And this is her new book, which was published by Patagonia, which is an interesting data point. Um, and in it, she offers a really great actual definition of regenerative agriculture. So I'm going mm. to that make that visible. It's not the one that I had seen before. And of course, you can phrase these things in different ways, but it really gets at exactly what you're describing, this more kind of deeper level integrated. Um, yeah, there's lots more I could say, but let's stick with- <laughs> I'll look for that. That sounds amazing. Yeah, yeah. And I'll make sure that that's visible in this assessment just to kind of keep cross-referencing the evolution of the ideas. So I love it. thank you for um, those perspectives on what is positive and, and maybe not so positive in terms of creating that future. Um, I'm going to keep along that line. I'm going to share my screen. Tell me if you see, do you see a little two by two matrix with your name on it? Yes, I do. All right. So you will know better than anybody that this is a dirty little trick because I <laughs> don't believe in the two by two matrix or its efficacy in terms of doing anything useful. Well, actually, it's efficacious, but not effective for truly understanding a company. <clears throat> Nonetheless, I'm using one here and you'll see why in a little bit. The object of the game here is to actually place the company versus issues. And I've got this bubble here. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna ask you to place it on the matrix. And I'll just explain briefly how this matrix works. The vertical line refers to ecosystem health or the company's impact on ecosystem health. Anything above the line contributes to that future you described. 
And the higher up on the line, the closer to plus five, the more it's contributing to that future. Below the line, we could interpret that it is undermining that future you described in relation to ecosystem health. And on the horizontal, we have societal health. Same idea, if it's contributing to the future you want in terms of society, it's going towards plus five. If it's undermining, it's going towards minus five. Now, you and I both know that society and an environment are intrinsically linked and that a two by two matrix is a very silly thing, but I would nonetheless invite you, if you would, to tell me where you would put this bubble. And you can tell me to put 10 bubbles. You can tell me to put no bubbles. And here, <laughs> here I do what you tell me. Yeah, so yeah, that is a tough one without knowing the full scope of their business. Um, from what I know, uh, I would probably put them at a minus one on both of them, on both axes. Mm -hmm. So about there? Yeah, just because I think there's a lot of impacts that their um, sourcing has on yeah. on the world that that uh, you know we don't necessarily see when we're at the grocery store. Mm -hmm. That being said, I think if I were to look at some of their peers, they would be much worse than that. I don't know what a plus five would be necessarily. Is that someone who is um, you know, they have their, they're growing all their own food. They don't use any pesticides and uh, it's all, it's all consumed locally or it's all consumed by a family or a community. I don't know what it is yet, <laughs> mm. but I, mm. I think that they are, they're thinking of the right things. It seems like from what I see, or at least they're communicating on mm -hmm. the right things. Um, but as part of a really large system, that sometimes they don't have control over it, um, or most of the time they don't have control over a, a, such a large system. They seem to be moving themselves and I think others in the right direction, but it still doesn't seem to, um, to me anyway, it doesn't seem to offset the fact that they are working with dairy products. They are extracting water from uh, different springs and, and whatnot and bottling mm. it up and shipping it somewhere. Um, mm. So yeah, <laughs> if we we're to simplify in the two by two matrix. Yep. Cool. Okay. That's great. And it's really helpful to hear your reasoning behind it. My next question was going to be why, but you, uh, you beat me to it. So that is terrific. Thank you for humoring that exercise. I'm going to stop sharing and get back to much more practical matters. Uh, but I, I really appreciate that. Um, and actually, these next couple of questions are debatable if they're practical, but they're, they're very fun. So we're going to go into a couple of scenarios here. And these are whatever you want them to be. This is okay. entirely out of Heather Mack's beautiful imagination, whatever should appear. So the first scenario goes like this. I just got some breaking news. Um, you are in charge of everything. The whole universe... <laughs> <laughs> Nothing is in the way. There are no barriers. What changes do you make to this company? <laughs> well, uh, yeah, I'm like, that sounds a bit like a dictatorship a bit, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I'm one of those people that are, that's, that are a bit uncomfortable making unilateral decisions. <laughs> Mm. So I feel like I need to understand the systems that mm. they're working within before actually saying, by decree, I want all of this to happen. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I think there's something around having a pause and, and just understanding all of that and just figuring out what all those impacts are. And uh, yeah, and just trying to work from that, I think. Mm -hmm. But I know that's a, that's a bit of a, um, an avoidance uh, answer. <laughs> that's okay. That's okay. But well, that's how I would answer that. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. And, you know, actually, as I think about the work you're doing in the diversity uh, trenches, trying to bring in diverse perspective, I think your answer really underscores that it's a listening exercise, not a dictating exercise. Yes. Yeah. So that's, that's kind of neat. Um, Awesome. Well, it was a fake news item anyway. So you're, <laughs> if you're not in charge of the universe. You're off the hook. No need for unilateral decisions. But 
this just in, uh, you actually have a direct line to the co-CEOs of the company. And last I checked, and I think this might be a moving target, but as I was pulling this together, there are two CEOs, uh, Veronique Pincianati bassetta and Shane Grant. And these two really want to know what you think. They are running the company. They want the best thinking possible. You are on their always answer her calls list. The thing is, they're super busy. So you only have 30 seconds in this particular conversation. What do you say to them? Yeah, whoo. <laughs> I, know, that's, I think that's even shorter than a tweet. Uh, so I think, uh, yeah, it almost goes back to my previous one where it's like, you know, I think for them, it's to not to stop interrogating their practices. I think uh, we talked about this recently about how a lot of companies kind of drink their own Kool-Aid and then stop questioning what they're doing until, you know, there's a campaign against them mm -hmm. or something. Mm -hmm. So I think there's something around humility and continuing to interrogate what they're doing and the impacts that they have on um, yeah, on, on the, on the world and, uh, in general. So there's that, um, I've already surpassed 30 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, um, I think for them, it's just making, uh, smallholder farmers, a central part of their equation, um, and then kind of centering, centering justice and livelihood concerns at the, uh, and basically poverty at the center of that. I, I think that that um, that eliminates a lot of issues, I think, whether from a social or an environmental perspective, if we look at deforestation or or yeah. other concerns as well. Um, but yeah, I think those would be my random collection of 30 second thoughts. Yeah, I love it. I love it. And hopefully they're also paying close attention to your Twitter feed, which is uh... Full of <laughs> way fewer than 30 seconds. So that's brilliant. Thank you. Um, those are all the questions I have prepared for this conversation, but I did want to see, is there anything I didn't ask you about that you want to make sure you put forward here? Anything at all? Whew. Nothing that I can think of. Those were some great thought provoking questions. Oh, thank you for including me on it. My pleasure. It's awesome. Great to hear your thoughts. So we'll wrap up here. I'll pause the recording with tons of gratitude. Thank you so much, Heather. Really appreciate it. <laughs> Thanks, Lorraine.